Thank you, Andrew. Um, before I introduce you, would you be able to start sharing your slides to check if everything's working? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to introduce Phil Jonathan and Matt Ross, so Matt Ross, Matt Jones, <laughs> sorry, I have Ross in my mind there. Uh, Matthew Jones is, uh, so Matthew Jones and Phil Jonathan both work at um, Shell. Um, Phil is the chief statistician at Shell and he's worked for Shell for over 30 years now. He's also a professor of, of environmental data science at Lancaster University. Phil got his PhD, I think, back in 1987, if I remember correctly, from the University of Swansea. Phil originally started out as a physicist and then joined Shell in about 88 as a mathematician. And then since then, he sort of slowly transitioned from physics and math into more statistics and sort of um, statistical modeling, applied statistics. Um, Phil has quite a range of interests um, in covering areas such as uncertainty quantification, Bayesian methods, computational statistics, and in the last few years, especially at Lancaster, I know he's been quite involved with extreme value theory methods. So extreme value theory methods are looking at sort of rare events, so probabilistic approaches to understanding what is the probability of a 100-year flood, for example. So Phil's been doing a lot of very exciting work about applying statistical methods within Shell and particularly within the context of environmental sciences. And this year, Phil was awarded the Greenfield Medal from the Royal Statistical Society. So this is a medal which is given out every three years for excellence in statistics within industry. So it's a um, great award to win. And uh, without further ado, I think I'll just pass over to Phil. Would you like to start? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the um, invitation and um, for the opportunity to, to speak to you um, today. So. So the talk is about um, decision support, but for environmental applications, right? So we'll be um, thinking about rare events, about monitoring and inversion um, in the environment and um, throughout about uncertainty quantification. So it's a joint talk with, um, with Matthew who's with me. Um, Matthew um, has done more of the uh, more recent work on, um, um, on, on methane monitoring, atmospheric methane monitoring. So um, in the panel discussion at the end, I, ho I hope that uh, Matthew will be able to uh, chip in with his expertise as well. And the slides are available on um, up the Lancaster website there. Okay. Okay, so um, just a bit more of an acknowledgement, right? Obviously, um, this is not um, that my work, um, that this is work of, um, of a large number of people, right? So um, some of my colleagues in, um, in Shell are mentioned there. Um, and of course we have um, collaborations, long-standing collaborations here with Lancaster, uh, with Cambridge, um, with Durham and Melbourne and the UK Met Office as well. Right? Um, so when Chris asked me to give this talk, he asked um, for somebody who was um, doing applications, right? So um, this talk is definitely going to be about um, applications. So if you're um, expecting um, a lot of methodology, I think you're going to be disappointed. There will be um, a number of references um, to methodology um, to the papers that we've written in recent years, but mainly it, it, um, the talk is going to be about um, what's, what, what is the application? Why is the application important? How did we go about it as um, statisticians or data scientists? So I'm gonna talk about two areas. And the first is um, extremes, um, so rare events, as Chris explained. Um, so we'll look at two particular situations. The first is um, non-stationary marginal extremes, um, and that'll kind of introduce the subject and some of the ideas. And then we'll go on to one of the more recent things we've been working on, which is um, um, multivariate spatial conditional um, extremes. And then the second part of the talk will be about remote sensing. Um, so airborne line of sight and satellite sensing um, of methane um, in particular uh, and also by the gases. Okay, so to start with um, extremes. Okay, so we're thinking about um, a random variable Y. Um, and we know, so it's gonna be an environmental variable, right? Um, and we know that typically, right, in, in, in physics and engineering, right, then when we observe large values or, 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 of variables that, that they um, are conditional, right? Their dis distributions can only express conditionally, right, on um, covariates, right? So for example, to make it um, specific, we could be thinking about um, a storm in the ocean um, and a storm in the ocean, um, its characteristics would be dependent, for example, on the month of the year, let's say, right? Or on the direction of the storm or on the water depth or, or characteristics of the pressure field, right? Or of fetch to, 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 to land, yeah? So if we want to um, understand and characterize extremes 
of that random variable, then obviously um, incorporating those covariate effects um, is, is important. Okay, so that's one part. So we need to incorporate the covariate effects. Um, the second thing is that we um, appeal to asymptotic theory in order to in order to come up with a likelihood um, which would be appropriate um, for modeling this kind of situation, right? So, so for example, we can look at the distributions of exceedances of a high threshold. Um, and, these, uh, and then there's um, uh, asymptotic theory for peaks of a threshold, um, which tells us that if we take that threshold psi to be um, high enough, then um, conditional on the covariates and that high threshold, that the distribution of um, the thing we're interested in is uh, GP. And here, GP stands for generalized Pareto North Gaussian process, right? And uh, this GP here has um, three parameters it has a shape and a scale, um, and the, the threshold, as we've mentioned. So, so we're interested in, in coming up with oh, essentially um, this equation down here, right? We, we're essentially um, in assessing risk, right? So we want to be able to calculate expected losses for systems S. Um, which involves an integral of this form. So we need to characterize the distribution of the covariates. We need to characterize the distribution of the of the environmental variables given the covariates. And then there might be an additional layer where we have some, let's say, response of some physical system in that environment, right? And then we might have a loss or a utility function, which is then a function of that response conditional on the characteristics of the system. Yeah, so throughout this, obviously, we want to reflect uncertainty fairly, right? We want some um, statistical and computational efficiency. Um, um, the kinds of applications that we've done so far um, are, are, are mostly in offshore and coastal design. So we're looking at the ocean environment. We're looking at winds and waves and currents. Um, you can imagine that um, there might be two situations where this might be important, right? You could think about what's called um, long-term design. So that would mean um, trying to um, estimate, let's say, a thousand-year event, or what are the what are the worst conditions that could um, that could um, happen in a, in a very long period, and therefore to, um, to help to design structures, if you like, right? How much steel? How much concrete? Um, what what is the optimal location of um, of wind turbines, for example, right? Um, but also these kinds of methods can be used for, um, if you like, shorter term. Um, optimizations as well. So, so if you're going to do um, optimization, uh, oh, sorry, if you're going to do inspection and maintenance at sea, then the, then um, topics kind of as window we weather windows become important. So this this is um, can I find um, a period of three or four hours within which I can do a particular activity with low risk. Okay, so again, um, it's a risk analysis, it's a decision problem. Um, the statistics or the mathematics of the decision problem um, are the same in, in both situations. So here are um, some of the papers that we've um, published um, on, on this and uh, kind of related subjects, um, and there'll be a list of um, references um, at the end. Okay, so this is a, a motivating application. Um, so you can see what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about a location which is just offshore um, Norway here, okay? Um, and what I want to do is I want to characterize extreme environment um, uh, at that location um, just offshore Norway. So the pictures here are showing the vari a variation of HS, which is significant wave height. So this is a measure of the variation, if you like, or, or the variance actually of the ocean surface over a period of time at a particular location as a function of direction. And direction um, is in this case um, measured um, clockwise um, from north at zero, um, and it, uh, it it tells us about the direction um, from which particular events are coming. Right. So what you can see in this case, right, is that there's a particularly unusual directional effect at around um, 220 degrees, and this corresponds to so 220 degrees corresponds to storms which are um, just able to pass around the um the coast of norway right so you have this funneling or focusing um, um at, at other angles right you, you the uh, the the launcher of norway gets in the way right so you don't see much but then suddenly you get this um huge um increase in the in the values of um of storm severity essentially in the variance of the ocean surface so clearly um a, a structure in the ocean needs to be particularly strong with respect to um this direction um here right Again, you see the same sort of thing with season. We all know that um, winter storms um, in the northern hemisphere, right, are going to be um, um, well. You know, January, um, January kind of storms, right? 
are going to be um, um, much um, more intense than um, storms in the in June or July, for example, right? So what we want to do is we want to build models and essentially they're smoothing models, okay? So the first two applications I've got here are applications of, of smoothing, but I've got a particularly um, sort of unpleasant likelihood to, um, to work with in, in establishing the inference. Okay, so the kinds of things that we do is that we would have a, um, a, uh, a density or, or the component of the likelihood, if you like, right, which is a, a two part. We need to be able to describe the distribution of events below some threshold with um, a threshold non exceeds probability tau. And then we're going to use this generous Pareto motivated by asymptotic considerations for um, exceedances of that threshold. Okay, so again, what we use below the threshold doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's, um, we could use a non parametric estimate, but here what we're going to do is use as a, a truncated Weibull log, a truncated Gumbel distribution of popular choices. So we want to infer this uh, non exceedance uh, probability tau. This is always a, a problematic um, um, thing to do, a problematic inference in, um, in extreme value theory, because um, you, you could imagine that the, that the characteristics of the GP tail depend um, quite strongly on the choice of tau, right? So, so estimating tau um, is a challenge in itself, okay? So we're going to try to do that as part of the inference. Um, and um, in principle, then all of these parameters of the truncated Weibull, the, the rho here is the rate of occurrence of threshold exceedances, um, and these three parameters here, which are parameters of the generalized Pareto distribution, they are all going to vary smoothly as a function of numerous covariates. But in this case, I'm going to talk about two. I'm going to talk about direction theta, and I'm going to talk about um, season phi. And if you want to um, know more about this model, then um, you can refer to Randall et al. So then in terms of the mechanics of doing the uh, inference, right? So we're, I'm going to choose a particular covariate representation and this is going to be uh, bead splines. Okay, so then on some index set of covariates on the covariate domain, we have um, a basis function, uh, so a basis, basis matrix, capital B and basis coefficients, uh, beta for each one of the um, parameters of interest. Um, and then, um, obviously, we can construct this um, baseline basis rather easily in one dimension, but you can use tensor products then to con construct bases um, in higher dimensions for multiple covariates. And then there are um, techniques um, known as um, GLAMs, right, your generalized linear, uh, linear additive models. So these are due to Curry et al. Um, and they provide very efficient um, uh, inference, uh, avoiding the, the calculations of these large tensor products. So then um, we're smoothing, we're doing penalized smoothing. Okay, so then the, the roughness of these spline um, representations is going to be penalized essentially by a quadratic form um, in roughness of the, of the beta parameters here. So P is my penalty matrix. Um, it takes this form so we can break it down into parts corresponding to the different um, parameters in the model and to the different covariates in the model, which is very convenient, of course. Um, this, this quadratic form here also provides a natural um, prior um, for beta. Um, and if we want to go the whole hog, as um, Bresga and Lang suggested in 2006, we can include stochastic um, roughness penalties within these penalty matrices as well. Um, so the so the basics of the of the, um, the penalized B spline methods called P splines is explained by various papers from Marx and Eilers, and our implementation of this work is um, is available in Zanini um, et al. Okay, so as a DAG, just to explain, it's a, a rather simple structure, right? So um, what we have is um, um, observations why. Um, tau we're going to take as a, as a constant, uh, but, uh, but an unknown. Um, so it's a, I mean, it's a scalar, which we have to estimate. Um, so we have the betas, the sets of betas, and then we have um, hyperparameters on, on those guys, right? So the inference is essentially um, relatively straightforward, right? It's sampling from full conditionals. And when those full conditionals are available in closed form, you skip sampling. Um, otherwise, it's Metropolis Hastings within Gibbs using um, suitable proposal mechanisms, and and here MLA is kind of our um, is our go-to method, and um, these are some of the um, uh, important um, literature um, backing that up. And then we can now start to look at um, some of the um, results um, that we obtain. Um, so I think I, what I want to emphasize maybe is the scale parameters. So 
the shape parameters of the of the of the tr truncated y voltage and the uh, Jemmer's Pareto distribution they are generally very hard to to uh, to estimate. So it's not that surprising that say for this shape parameter we don't really pick up too much structure. We would need huge sample sizes in order to in order to be able to to characterize the direction and seasonal variation here. I think the sample we're looking at here is of the order of 50 or 60 years. Um, it's coming from a hindcast. So, which is a, a computer model um, for um, the uh, motion environment, which has been calibrated to observations from boys, for example. Um, um, so, the Poisson rate is clearly picking up a very big um, directional effect, which is exactly what we saw, if you remember earlier, in the directional picture for significant wave height. Um, and, the, and the two scale factors are again reflecting exactly what we what we saw in the data, right? So, we're seeing. Um, um, large values of scale um, corresponding to storms um, from the Atlantic, which are able to pass around the headland of Norway um, at around 200, 270 degrees. Um, and we're also seeing this, um, this minimum corresponding to summer months at around 90 degrees, corresponding to the, the fetch limitations of the, or the sheltering from the, from the landmass of Norway again. So we do the same kind of thing here for the um, for the non-exceedance probability. The dashed curve here shows the the prior that we um, that we placed, and the um, the the black um, shows the um, posterior of the estimate for the distribution of tau. So how do we use all this information? Well, we use it to um, inform um, um, engineering decisions, right? And without going into detail about the, the, the pictures on the right hand side, if we just look at the left hand side, we've got direction and season. And what we've done here is estimate the 100 year maximum, but as a function uh, of the two covariates. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is um, one way that uh, an engineer then could decide um, which months of the year would be more appropriate for a, um, a particular um, um, activity, uh, how um, one vessel might approach another ve vessel in particular uh, conditions, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, okay, I think that's enough on that. Okay, so the next thing is going to be um, also about extremes, but about um, multivariate um, extremes. So use cases here are rare events in multivariate distributions. So obviously this doesn't um, only occur um, in environmental applications. Um, you can imagine um, then this happening in lots of different places. I mean, finance is an, is, is an, is an obvious um, application, right? Um, so we are particularly interested here in, in temporally or spatially um, dependent rare events. Um, so for example, you might be interested in um, what is, good, what is the shape of a time series near a very large excursion? Okay, so I want a model for the shape of a time series near an extreme event, right? So we can use extreme value theory again um, to come up, come up with a, a likelihood essentially, right? Which is, um, which is appropriate to describe that sort of situation. And again, imagine storms in the ocean, you might be interested in knowing the spatial extent um, of those storms, yeah? So there are two approaches essentially to model these kinds of situations. The first is motivated by um, spatial statistics um, or spatial extremes, I should say, maybe. Um, and uh, the most popular um, um, methods here are, are based on max stable processes. Um, and they're related to things like copulas, right? And there's a talk here if you're interested on, on, on those techniques. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about conditional extremes. So this is kind of like um, an extension of the work I've already um, uh, talked to you about, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition on one variable um, at one location. Um, I'm going to assume that the value of that variable is large. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with a model for um, the distribution of another variable. Okay, so you can imagine how this would be applied in a spatial context. I might have a maximum um, at some location zero. Okay, the value of the maximum would be y and y would be very big. Okay, so then I'm interested in knowing what the spatial structure on some neighborhood S is around zero. Okay, so the, um, the, the recent work that we've done on this um, topic is, um, is reported in these papers. Um, and just a note on extreme dependence for people who are not um, used to thinking about extremes, right? You can your intuition about the body of a distribution can often be quite um, um, misleading when you start to think about um, extreme value analysis, right? So, so I mean, in, in a nutshell, dependence in the body of a distribution and the dependence in the tail are quite different, right? So, 
in kind of MATLAB or Python speak here, right? If I, if I, if I imagine a situation where I have a bivariate um, random variable with components X and Y, they're, um, they're, they're normally distributed mean zero with, um, with, a, with a correlation rho where rho is less than one, okay? Then the probability, the conditional probability of Y exceeding some level X um, given that x is exceeding that level x is equal to zero, right? It's not equal to anything to do with rho, right? It, and it's particularly not equal to one, it's equal to zero, right? So the normal distribution is an, um, is an example of a, of, a, of a distribution which exhibits some um, asymptotic independence, right? So models which are appropriate to um, describe um, the body of distributions um, are not appropriate to um, describe the tails of those distributions often. Um, yeah, okay. So the study I'm going to talk to you about today, right, is, um, it is motivated by a need to understand the spatial characteristics of extremes from satellite observations and from Heinkast computer model output. Um, again, the applications you can imagine, they're similar to what um, um, I discussed earlier. Um, the, it's motivated by um, um, these the, the papers here um, by Schutter et al, um, which you can see at the end again. Um, and the main competitors, as I've mentioned, are these max stable processes and then extensions thereof. So the underpinning result is due to Jan Heffernan and um, Jonathan Torn um, from Lancaster University. And it's that provided that I am able to um, find a high enough threshold um, and I express um, my um, random variables on, on a standard marginal scale. And here I've chosen a Laplace scale um, that um, I, I, I can prove asymptotically that I have this form, right? So the form of the distribution of Y, given that um, X equals X, um, looks a bit like a, um, a, a regression model, essentially, with, um, with a, with a non-constant variance, right? So I've got this kind of slope term alpha multiplied by the value of X, plus I've got this scaling X to the beta on some residual process Z. And um, the residual process is unknown. It depends, of course, on the un underlying distribution that's, um, that's generating X and Y. But for, um, for, uh, um, for estimation purposes, we assume, um, for example, a normal distribution or extensions thereof. Um, and then we, instead of um, adopting the mu and the sigma squares for, for, for subsequent inferences, we actually take random or we take um, empirical samples of the residuals and, and, and use those in, um, in simulations and in um, downstream estimation. So here's an um, example. So you've got um, Iceland, you've got um, the UK and Ireland, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at um, this transect essentially of locations. This is very interesting. These are some of the most extreme um, ocean environments in, on the planet, right? So what I want to do is I want to characterize the, the joint distribution of um, significant wave fight um, a, 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 along this trajectory. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to condition on a large value at the first quantity, right? So one quantity, the green quantity here at this location. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate essentially conditional spatial profiles for lots of other quantities. That's where there are different colors here. Each color represents a quantity. Um, and then uh, those quantities at lots and lots of different locations, right? So mathematically, what I've got is um, I've got um, 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 random variables that I index with J and K. Okay, so J index a location, K index um, the quantity of interest. I'm first going to have to transform them to standard um, Laplace scale. And in order to do that, I'm going to use exactly the methodology I described in the first part of the talk. Um, and then I'm going to fit um, uh, a, multi, uh, a multivariate um, uh, conditional spatial extremes model, which is basically this. This is, the light, this is where the likelihood comes from. Okay, and then I'm going to make a particular assumption about the um, distribution of the um, residuals and if you like, or the residual process. So and I'm going to assume it's a delta Laplace. So which includes the Laplace distribution and the Gaussian distribution of special cases um, determined by the value of this um, parameter delta. So this guy has, um, it's obviously multivariate, right? It's a mean mu. It has, a, um, uh, if you like, marginal variances, which I'm representing by sigma squared. And it has a correlation structure, um, capital sigma, um, which is itself represented in terms of three parameters, lambda, rho, and k. And these are kind of correlation lengths, you know, that you'd use in a Gaussian process, for example. Um, so again, this is going to be solved using um, MCMC to estimate all of the parameters. 
we're going to assume that um, these parameters, the ones which are spatially dependent, they vary spatially smoothly. And I'm going to use a piecewise linear form for that. Again, I could have used the splines that I used before. And then um, the capital sigma, as I mentioned, right, it's a residual correlation for a conditional Gaussian field. And again, we could have chosen lots of different um, 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 distributions to explain the dependent structure here. We've used um, power exponential with distance. Um, and this work um, is um, reported in um, these two papers. Okay, so um, a bit more about the data and the inference, right? So we've got two data sources. The first is METOP, um, scatterometer um, data. Okay, so we get one daily passes over a location on the planet, right? And from that, we're taking um, U10, which is um, an estimate of the wind speed at 10 meters altitude. Um, we also taking um, computer model uh, output. Um, so this is a Nora 10. This is a hindcast, one of the popular hindcasts for this part of the world. And from this, we um, have directional information about um, significant wave height and also uh, wind field information. So the inference is relatively straightforward. Again, it's using MCMC, adaptive MCMC um, from Roberts and Rosenthal uh, with piecewise linear forms for the parameters. And the kinds of results we come up with um, are these. So on the x-axis, you have um, distance in kilometers, and then you have the, 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 the estimates of the various parameters with, um, um, with um, credible intervals on them, right? So you can see um, rather um, interestingly here, right, for the three um, variables that I'm looking at here, and they're referenced down here. So this is satellite wind, hindcast wind, and hindcast wave, that the spatial decay of the three quantities, um, which is um, encoded with, uh, by alpha, is rather similar, right? So after about 500, 600 kilometers, we know that the that the linear term in the um, in the, um, the the model, right, has, has decayed to effectively zero. But this is uh, but the extra parameters here tell us about the behavior of the um, of the dependent structure um, as well, right? So again, we can use um, these these kinds of estimates now to cal calculate expected losses and to, 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 to fix some um, optimal structural characteristics um, in the same way as it before. Okay, so um, now I'll move on to the second part of the talk, which is about um, remote sensing of gaseous and particular emissions. So I want to talk about um, three data sources here. Um, I'm going to mention a couple of them at the beginning and then I'll move on to the third at the end, right? Um, so. Um, we've done uh, a number of papers. Um, Bill Hurst, my colleague, um, writes sort of the, this was the first paper um, on airborne um, remote sensing. Then there have been follow up papers um, on um, line of sight um, sensing. Okay, so um, as there are credits here as well to the to the to the owners of the of the various technologies. Um, at the moment, we're playing with um, drones um, and with um, satellite data as well, right? So what what's all of this about? Well, methane is a very important greenhouse gas, right? Depending on how you quantify it, quantify its global warming potential, it's kind of um, 70 to 100 or maybe, you know, times um, more um, important in terms of or, uh, in terms of its global warming potential over 20 years. So it's a very, very important gas to, to be able to model and to be able to um, understand in terms of its um, atmospheric um, concentrations, right, over very, very different scales. So using scatterlights, you might want to make um, global quantifications of the amount of methane in the atmosphere from, from um, um, let's say, exogenous sources, right? Um, and you might want to make um, quantifications on much smaller spatial scales, right? So this is an illustration of a case study that we did a few years ago um, around a Canadian landfill site. So these are actual measurements using an aeroplane to fly around um, and, the, and the blue dots are kind of representing the concentration of, of methane and the, the, the black um, sort of um, um, areas are representing the uh, locations of landfills. Um, then this is a more recent study um, at Chilbolton at the at a schematic of what we did at the Chilbolton um, Observatory. So this is um, Hurst um, et al. 2020. And here what we're doing is using line of sight sensors. So what you have is you have um, a laser source and then you have essentially mirrors, but they're um, fancy mirrors, they're called retro reflectors. So then what we're doing is measuring path integrated um, concentrations. And here what we have is um, some, some um, images, some illustrations of um, source locations and plumes. 
um, and then we're trying to kind of consider obviously optimal design here, right? Um, for a given um, for a given let's say prior distribution of sources and source strengths, um, spatially, what would be the optimal um, distribution of, um, of 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 laser and retroreflectors? Okay. So um, it's a very simple um, problem to, to, to write down, right? We have observations Y, um, we have a background B, right? Which can be um, problematic, I, I should mention, right? So if you imagine methane in the atmosphere, right? You're measuring about 1.8 um, parts per billion, okay? Um, whereas if you look at something like carbon dioxide in the um, atmosphere, you're looking at 420 parts per million, right? So um, background variability in carbon dioxide concentration because of, um, let's say, plants and stuff like this, right? Um, is that, so the diurnal changes in background um, CO2 are significant and, uh, and they're a big problem in trying to use this kind of technology um, to measure um, 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 CO2 sources. But for um, methane, it's, 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 it's a relatively um, simpler um, challenge. Um, so S is going to be some source. Okay, D is going to be some sort of calibration offset. I might be using different instruments with, with different um, cal cal calibration characteristics. I'm going to assume a Gaussian error with some precision lambda. And then A is going to be a forward model, essentially a dispersion model. Um, the simplest thing we could do is to assume like a Gaussian plume, which is where a lot of the um, early work is done, right? Um, but obviously we could go all the way through to um, CFD calculations there, right? If, if necessary, and if we had the computational time and resources. <clears throat> so um, uh, the inference is again um, um, Bayesian, right? So the posterior can be written in this form. It's a likelihood multiplied by a rather no, simple assumptions about uh, the priors on the on the various parameters. Um, we need to make some assumptions about the, the smoothness of the of the background relative to the spikiness or the sparsity. Um, of the sources and the and the interplay between the, our 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 choices for background smoothness and um, source sparsity, right, is very important, right. And, and in in applications where we don't have a lot of data, then those prior decisions, for example, can be very um, important and influential. So we've used um, different um, inference techniques um, in the in the 2013 work. We used reversible jump MCMC. Um, so essentially we had um, three sources where we were estimating the number of sources and their number, number of characteristics. In most um, recent work, we actually used um, a simpler model where we had um, a fixed grid of um, candidate sources and then um, estimated those things. Okay, so inference again, very similar to what I talked about last time, full conditions were possible, other, uh, otherwise um, Metropolis Hastings with um, gradient-based ML kinds of proposals. Okay, so these are the, so again, these are just an illustration of um, some of the inferences that we get. So again, you've seen this before. This is the observations of the Canadian landfill. And this is kind of like a starting solution that we had, which we um, obtained using um, a, an optimization scheme uh, to start the um, MCMC inference off. And then we have um, poster posterior medians here. Um, so you can see that um, actually for this landfill, we've, we, we've done a really, really good job. Um, this one we didn't do quite as well, right? And this was actually to do with um, um, triangulation, essentially, right? There were problems with the, the wind directions that we were measuring, and the, the wind direction obviously is in, uh, informing the, the plume model that we used um, for this inference. So it led to um, um, improvements and corrections to the way that we were um, implementing the wind field. Okay. So then um, another area that we're interested in is satellite sensing, right? So there are um, various um, sources of um, um, good satellite data. So for example, Sentinel-5 um, Tropomi um, is a, a natural, um, um, a natural go-to, right? So this is tropospheric um, monitoring instrument, right? Um, the data publicly available. Um, there are a few issues with Tropomi, right? There's, um, so if we're looking for individual sources, then basically five tons per hour is the is the smallest source that we would be able to see, and the Tropomi pixels are of the order of five kilometers. Yet yeah, it's, it's um, 0.01 arcs. Um, there are um, 
So the, um, there are private companies that are available, for example, GSG SAT, right, who, which do a better job, right? Um, they, they can get down to sources of um, about 100 kilometers per hour and in principle down to around 50 meter spatial resolution. Um, so um, Tropomi uh, measures daily and globally. Um, it's a uh, quantification of um, column integrated concentrations, but there are a number of sensor limitations um, which make using the data um, reliably, if you like, on a daily basis, kind of quite um, complicated. And Matthew will be able to speak to these things. So, for example, over the oceans, the, the readings are not good. Um, uh, methane can't be seen through cloud. There are albedo and reflection effects. And then there are um, these striping effects. Um, which are caused by the, the CCDs within the um, within the um, satellite itself, within the TRIPOMI instrument, right? Which we need to take account of. Um, so, um, so mention here for some of the work um, that we're doing with colleagues um, at Cambridge. Um, so, what we're trying to do is to use um, nitrogen dioxide as a surrogate for methane. So, for example, when we have cloud cover, we might be able to do something with NO2, which we can't. Um, um, using methane. It's, um, NO2 is more easily detected. Um, it has better spatial coverage than um, CH4 for the reasons I've just mentioned. And it have a half-life of days, right? The half-life of CH4 is about 12, 13, 14 days, whereas the half-life of um, NO2 is much shorter, right? So it means that if I want to identify plumes, um, then using NO2 is kind of a natural go-to again, yeah? So we have a, a model which is linking um, um, observations of um, of NO2, the N, right, to, to, to some like a system level of, of NO2, um, this guy um, with some Gaussian evolution error. Um, we have um, observations of CH4, um, which is again linked to some sort of system level with, um, with, um, with, with these are measurement noises and evolution errors. So these are with these measurement noises. And then we have a system which is um, evolving again in a kind of linear form. It's a very, very simple um, model, um, but it works. Um, and again, we, and we use um, um, MCMC to get the solution. And this is the kind of um, illustration that um, thanks to Clay Roberts at, um, at Cambridge, at IOA in Cambridge, um, for this picture, right? So this is um, what we get if we only use um, methane um, observations from Tripomi. But if we supplement the methane with um, NO2 observations, this is the kind of reconstruction that we get. So you can see it's a it's a it's a vastly imp improved um, reconstructions. There are there are issues, of course, right? Um, and, and maybe we can talk about that in the discussion a bit a, a bit later on. Um, but it, but in principle, this kind of idea works. Okay, so um, that's it. Um, in summary, right, um, I guess we're about coupling of physical and statistical knowledge within appropriate frameworks for inference, um, exploiting growing sources of data for direct observation and um, physical models, right, and um, careful uncertainty quantification, which we normally get via Bayesian inference for our better decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, as Andrew's already mentioned, please add any questions you have to the chat and I'll uh, field the chat. Okay. Um, so just to start off with, um, if you don't mind, I'll ask the first question. Um, so you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk, you said you're going to focus very much on applications and not on methodology. Now, when you're working on applied problems, it's a bit of an issue, I guess, that the methodology and the theory that's been established has certain assumptions. So the theory is all nice if you follow the assumptions, but then in practice, the assumptions aren't always going to hold. So I was wondering, like, from your experience, how do you sort of handle that discrepancy? Yeah, yeah, a good question. Yeah, I understand. Um, well, for example, um, um, there are certain issues that might be worked on in an uh, academic setting, right, which are probably secondary um, in, an, in an application setting, right? Um, and there are other issues which are almost rarely considered or, or swept under the carpet, if, if you like, in an academic setting, right, which are um, of primary importance, let's say, in applications, right? So. Um, uh, an example of this, the one I always sort of bang on about in, in an extreme setting is the effect of covariates, right? So in an academic setting, covariates are a nuisance, okay? There's something that um, stop you from being able to, uh, to fit your nice um, extreme value model or to develop your theory for two, three, four, uh, five dimensions, right? Whereas in an application setting, getting those um, 
getting those covariate effects um, modeled well, or for example, um, modeling the threshold for extreme value analysis is incredibly important, right, in terms of um, good stable inference, right? And again, you know, some of these topics are tackled academically, yes, but then maybe that's where, um, you know, people like us who are kind of um, scientists within um, industrial um, organizations, right? That's where we need to do our work, right? Is to, is to make sure that we, um, yeah, you, you add that middle ground, right? So um, so that we are comfortable, comfortable that um, the methods that let's say we borrow or we tailor from, from academia um, work well in practice. You mentioned quite a few times in the talk, this idea of using Bayesian modeling approaches mm. to give you the sort of uncertainty quantification. Now, with all the uh, models you were discussing, you had to use MCMC in order to sort of sample from the posterior. So that's obviously a bit more computationally intensive. So someone could naturally ask, well, do you need to be a Bayesian? Do you not to be a frequentist? Do you sort of maximum likelihood approach? So I guess I'm kind of asking, what for the extra effort of being a Bayesian, what does it give you? Well, I think, well, Matthew, you should definitely jump in here, man. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the natural uncertainty quantification for me, right, is, 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 is an obvious win, right? I mean, the natural framework that we can set everything up as decision problems, right? We can always be thinking about um, maximizing utility and stuff like that. It seems so natural to me, right? And it, it feels like the go-to. Clearly, when you've got big problems, I mean, we have, um, you know, we've, we work on things like Cox processes, for example, right? Where, you know, you've got doubly intractable integrals and things like like this to do and then trying to do MCMC and stuff like that is really hard right and then going to techniques you know the various techniques that are out there like expectation maximization whatever right those are those are those are those are attractive in those kinds of situations but I must admit that the uh, yeah I, I just find the, the Bayesian approach um, more appealing right so I would try to stay as close as I could to that approach right um um, yeah, yeah, provided that it's computationally tractable, of course. Matthew? I think, I think arguably in, um, you know, well, it, certainly in the, the methane monitoring application, which I can speak more about, right, but I think arguably in extremes as well, it's difficult not to be um, Bayesian just purely in terms of the prior information you need to be able to put in to make the, the you know, to make the solution work essentially, right? So so as Phil was saying in the talk, you know, in the methane monitoring example, and um, the name of the game is being able to tell what natural background of methane um, and what's which came from outside of your site. Um, and what's local source contributions, right? Um, and you don't, you, you don't typically, the only thing that you typically know about that is that you expect the, you know, uh, colloquially the background to be smooth and the source contributions to be spiky, right? Um, so, you know, you kind of have to encode that in your model through um, some set of prior assumptions about the time, spatial temporal evolution of the background concentration and the sparsity of the source map, right? It's kind of the only thing that really allows you to proceed there, right? But we don't necessarily, I mean, you know, using MCMC there is kind of, it, yeah, is definitely a choice that we don't necessarily have to make. You know, we could we could just solve the problem with the priors, uh, find a map estimate solution and call it done, right? Um, though, yeah, in, in, yeah, it would save some time in some situations in the methane monitoring application, but typically the MCMC and the sort of um, uh, quantifying the uncertainty brings a lot of benefit because there can be quite a lot of uncertainty about where the sources and how strong it is just based on the limited data that you you do have right mm -hmm. so how does this then feed into the sort of decision making process because you've got your posterior distributions you, have, you understand the uncertainty but then you have to give this to I don't know, a pilot maybe who's flying his plane down to go find methane so i mean how do you how, how do you sort of like convert that sort of like statistical understanding into something which a practitioner could apply yeah well i think i, I think that there are um, Chris, there's, there's a hundred answers to that question, I think, right? Um, the, the best answer to that question is where um, there has been a, a kind of the longest, the longest term relationship between the, the statisticians and data scientists and the, and the engineers that are working on this, right? So they were, are quite happy to, to, to think in terms of loss, essentially, or expected loss, right? So there, the equation I showed on the very first slide or the second slide, right? We can actually go that far, right? We can actually calculate loss. Right. Um, of course. Um, so in some of the extremes work, we're able to do that. Right. Um, in other areas, we can't get anywhere near that because we don't understand, you know, all of the parts. We can't write down all of those integral uh, uh, integrants at, at all. Right. So um, 
so yeah it's it's more it's more difficult right and then sure um in a lot of cases people are used to having point solutions right and they simply have no way of 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 propagating uncertainty even though we can give them a probabilistic solution right they have no way of passing that uncertainty forward into their calculation so then obviously we try to work with them to get to sensible solutions right but but that is definitely application dependent right i think I think in, in the methane case, right, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's still under sort of technology development to a certain extent, right? But, uh, you know, the, the way in which it seems to kind of work at the moment is that, you know, we, we get some, we, we try and install a long-term monitoring solution at a site, right? Uh, so we read concentration observations as close to 24-7 as we can. Um, and then whenever some kind of anomaly is seen in the data and, you know, definition of anomaly, I'm not going to get into, right? But it's also a subject in its own right. Right. Um, we when that happens, we would try to um, invert it to identify sources. And then if we run an MCMC on that, we would effectively try and summarize that into a simple, you know, these are the places on the site where we ever had uh, a methane source feature in our solution. Right. And these were the emission rates that we got when the source was in that location um, and then provide that information to the site and to operators who then have to go in with, um, you know, did, Typically, it's something like a FLIR camera, which is like an infrared camera, which can see plumes of methane. And um, they were an, an operator would go in with a piece of equipment like that, and then try and you know focus the search area on where the the kind of algorithm using the concentration me measurements is suggested initially, um, and search for which piece of equipment is actually causing um, the emissions within that. Right. Um, so yeah, still being worked out to a certain extent, but that's that's approximately how it works at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no sort of further questions in the chat, then um, let's thank Phil and Matthew again for a very interesting talk. And the next um, data centric engineering webinar will be on 1st of December. It will be uh, Philip Hennig. So please come along and join us again. It will again be a Wednesday at four o'clock. Okay, so um, we'll end the session there. Thank you all very much for joining. And thanks again to Phil and Matt. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone.